Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Alan Sainz. I'm the owner of Sala. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for coming today and, and participate of these events. You know, we've been trying to do this Oppenheimer Festival with the idea of experience uh, the movie in a different way, not just going watch the movie and what Christopher Nolan has created, which I haven't watched it yet, but everybody tells me that it's really good. But... <laughs> But doing all these things and the things that we are learning and the documentaries and lectures and all the conversations, I think that adds more value and what a better place than here in Los Alamos. So I'm glad that we did it and we had people coming from all over uh, to come here to Sala. So that is pretty cool. So today uh, we have John Rominer and Nancy Bartlett they did a talk uh, on Saturday, so they're doing it again, and they fixed some of the things on the PowerPoint as well, so it's going to be even better. So, John, if you can come, please. Okay, thank you, Alan, and thank you all for coming. We've got this controversial topic to talk about tonight, the decision to drop the bomb. And it's a topic with so many different opinions and, and a lot of emotion. But we found that there's also quite a bit of misinformation out there that we're going to try to address this evening. It's not our intention to try to convince anybody to change their mind, but we are going to provide some historic background that you can then take into account deciding how you feel about the decision to drop the bomb. So some historians and many people today, probably more than half the country, believe we did not have to drop the bombs to end the war. That Japan would have surrendered long before the invasion. But, you know, that, that, that opinion kind of evolved over the, the eight, eight, almost eight decades since the war ended. At the very end of the war, you know, the veterans are coming home, starting their new lives, and it's not working, Alan. And neither one of them is working, so. So this is all being recorded. So yeah, we're, we're going to edit this part out, okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah, now let's see. Let me see if that works. Okay. Good. So anyway, the, um, so at the end of the war, most of the country kind of bought into the story that uh, they heard what Truman had to say, and they accepted the story that the bombs kind of ended the war and avoided an invasion that would have cost hundreds of thousands, or more likely maybe millions of lives, both Japanese and, um, and allies. But then, 
you know, in the kind of early 60s, when the uh, Cold War was heating up, and you know the, the Russians had the H bomb, some scholars were taking a new look at the whole question, the whole issue, and they said, well, you know, wait a minute, you know, it, it wasn't just drop the bombs or invade. There are other events that could have caused the Japanese to surrender. You know, they say they were trying to surrender. Or we could have just continued the blockade and the bombing, and that, that would have brought them to their knees. Conventional bombing. Uh, when the Soviets invaded, that would have certainly brought about a surrender. Or why didn't we just do a demonstration? You know, a demonstration might have convinced the Japanese leaders and the rest of the world that this new weapon was so horrible that they would have surrendered. And then finally, um, you know, we could have just compromised on the uh, demand for unconditional surrender, particularly where the emperor was concerned. You know, that may have brought about a surrender. You know, there's some very reputable, very uh, outstanding uh, historians that fall in both camps. I know that uh, Martin Sherwin and uh, Kai Bird are kind of in this camp, okay? Um, Richard Rhodes, Richard Frank, uh, Evan Thomas, who wrote a very recent book on the subject, you know, they're up here. Okay. And then what about the Japanese? You know, how, how did they think this war was going to end? What, was, what were their expectations? So I'm going to go through, you know, all these bullets, uh, give kind of the pros and cons of each one. Um, I'm going to take about almost 45 minutes, probably. And then uh, Nancy will follow with comments she has about uh, the POWs and about the targets and maybe some other topics. And then we'll be opening it up to any comments, any questions, any discussion you might, might have. So I'm going to start with the Japanese. By the middle of 45, the Japanese government and their leaders, they knew they could no longer defeat the Allies. You know, their military had suffered very major defeats. Places like Saipan, Iwo Jima, uh, Okinawa. You know, we were, we were right on their doorstep. Their navy was almost destroyed. They had no air defense to speak of. Uh, their merchant fleet was at the bottom of the ocean, so they weren't bringing in supplies, either military or... Um, or food. Germany, by mid-June, after Okinawa, Germany had already surrendered unconditionally. And the Soviets, in about March, had renounced the neutrality pact that they had with Japan. So why didn't they just surrender? You know, we may not understand it. But the fact is, they just chose a different path, okay? And, and when I say they chose a different path, I, I don't mean the Japanese people, you know, they really didn't have that much to say about it. What I'm talking about is, the, you know, the they was the Supreme Council for the direction of the war. This is six individuals, six individuals. Two army, two navy, two diplomats. They're all like an inner cabinet. Uh, the two diplomats were the, included the prime minister and the foreign minister. Okay. So any important decision about the conduct of the war was made by this Supreme Council. And their decisions had to be unanimous. There were no four to two votes. You know, uh, 
no majority rules. It had to be unanimous, a unanimous decision. And only then would the emperor put his stamp of approval on the decision. Okay. And interestingly, if the council, the Supreme Council, did make a unanimous decision, the emperor had no choice but to give it a stamp of approval. So he didn't really have veto power. Okay. So it's just the way their system worked. So the strategy of the Supreme Council, and it particularly the military side of the council, but they were pretty unanimous on this in the beginning, was that there would be a final decisive battle. That would be the defense of the homeland. I mean, they had still three million armed, trained soldiers on the home islands. They had 10,000 kamikaze airplanes, and they had uh, on the order of 20 million civilian militia. And this final decisive battle was going to be so costly to both sides that uh, a war-weary United States would offer terms more favorable than unconditional surrender. And they were adamant, this, this is where we're going. We're going to go fight to the bitter end. So unconditional surrender was rejected unanimously by the Supreme Council. Instead, what they were looking for were four conditions that had to be met in order to uh, terminate the hostilities. They get to retain their army, their navy, and their weapons for defense. There would be no occupation of the homeland, no war trials, and they retain the role of their divine emperor, Hirohito. Those were the four conditions they were demanding. And we know that because we had broken their codes, both their military and their diplomatic codes. All the messaging that was going back and forth between the military leaders and the, you know, the prime minister and the emperor, we had all that information. I say we had it. It was held at a very high level. You know, it wasn't widely known, but we had broken their codes. Called ultra, that was the, that was the military traffic and magic was the diplomatic traffic. And all the messaging that we had right up to the time when the bombs were dropped indicated that the Japanese were determined to fight to the bitter end. All right, what might this final decisive battle been like? I want to talk, we don't know because it never happened, but I want to compare it what it might have been to a couple of battles that did take place that, you know, we can, that might be similar. So the Allied plan for the invasion of the Japanese home islands was called Operation Downfall. It was to start on November 1st, 1945. And the plan was my helper. There it is. I get it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the plan was to do an amphibious landing on this island right here. That's Kyushu. As an island, it had about 8 million population. You know, major cities like uh, Nagasaki and Kokura. And our plan, Operation Downfall, was to land 750,000 Marines and soldiers on the island in an amphibious landing. And the Japanese knew Militarily, that's what made sense. They knew that was where we were going to uh, land. And so they had 750,000 of their trained soldiers 
on the island ready to defend the land. You kind of com compare that to D-Day, which we all know was the greatest amphibious landing in the history of the world. We landed 150 soldiers, 150,000 soldiers, compared, you know, five times as many for Operation Downfall. And the defenders, 50,000 on the beach, and 750,000 Japanese defenders on the island, as well as on the order of two million civilian militia. Um, that was the first stage. After Kyushu, the plan was to go on to the main island, Honshu, where we had 1.2 million. And uh, they were defending it with two and a quarter million soldiers and maybe 15 million civilians. Now, D-Day is not exactly the right comparison to Operation Downfall, because D-Day was one day. You know, the battle for Normandy lasted a couple months. We lost, we had, had 250,000 allied casualties in the battle for Normandy. Germans had about the same number because we kept pouring troops in and they brought in reinforcements. So that kind of gives you an idea what it might have been like to, uh, to invade this island of Kyushu. Now, you might question, where do these civilian militia numbers come from? Well, in March of 1945, the Japanese cabinet passed a special conscription law. They created this militia unit. They called them Volunteer Fighting Forces Corp. Every male, age 15 to 60, and every female, age 17 to 40, which was about a quarter of the population, they were expected to defend the homeland with their lives. They were armed with bamboo sticks and porch port and uh, rocks and whatnot, but they were, and sometimes you could be used as a shield for the rest of the army. And they were in expected not only to defend the landing forces, but then eventually form guerrilla units in the cities, the towns, and the mountains. So a much, probably much better comparison to what Operation Downfall might have been like on the island of Kyushu was if we look at the Battle of Okinawa. The Battle of Okinawa went, was for two and a half months from April to June, 1945. There was a land battle. The Americans landed about 180,000 troops. The Japanese had 130,000 defenders. Our casualties were 49,000. They didn't have as many casualties because they had many more fatalities because the Japanese soldier you know, fought to the bitter end. But here's one of the big differences now. On D-Day, we're landing forces in France where the civilian population is welcoming us, you know, and friendly. Here, we're landing uh, on an island, Okinawa, where uh, the inhabitants consider us to be monsters and very, very unfriendly. So there was a civilian population of Okinawa of about 300,000, and the Okinawa civilian deaths were about 100,000. Now the different estimates range from about 75,000 to 150,000, but most of them said 100,000. That's like a third of the population gave their life in different ways to defend the island. So to say that a quarter of the population might come into play as a civilian militia is, is not out of line. The other thing that was very different about the battle for Okinawa was there was an enormous naval battle. We had an armada of 1,200 allied ships surrounding Okinawa, 40 aircraft carriers, 
18 battleships, almost 200 destroyers. And it just shows you how, how much this war had escalated. Um, and the Japanese introduced this new defensive weapon, the kamikaze aircraft. They had, done, they had used kamikazes in earlier battles, but never to this extent. Never waves after waves of hundreds of uh, aircraft uh, going after our ships. And the losses, we had over 400 ships damaged or sunk. That's 20 times Pearl Harbor. And, and these 36 Allied ships that were sunk, you know, they're at the bottom of the ocean. They're not just in this shallow bay. We lost 763 aircraft. That's four times what we lost at Pearl Harbor. And um, we lost 4,900 sailors. Twice the number, almost twice the number lost in Pearl Harbor. And of course the Japanese lost all their airplanes and, and pilots. So this war had escalated just tremendously. I mean, there are already 60 million fatalities in World War II. It's, it's really hard to realize how bad, how horrible things were. All right. Um, well, as I said, in the 60s, people started looking, you know, maybe there's other choices. Maybe we didn't have to drop the bombs. Maybe we didn't have to invade. So I'm going to go through five of the more common uh, ex uh, choices that are speculated that uh, might have happened. And the first one is the one you hear most often. Japan was ready to surrender. They were approaching the Soviets as mediators. Almost anybody that uh, is, is opposed to having used the bombs in the war. This is the first sentence they come up with. Um, and it's kind of upsets me because it's historically just inaccurate. It just, they were not asking to surrender. They were seeking some kind of negotiated settlement based on those four conditions that I mentioned. And they were absolutely adamant. And, and those conditions were completely unacceptable to, to the Allies. Okay. I sometimes like to think, what would have happened if you back up three months when the Allies were just on the outside, uh, in the outskirts of Berlin, if the German leaders had said, you know, time out, we'll consider surrendering if we keep our army, our navy, and our weapons, there's no occupation of the homeland, no war trials, and we keep in power our beloved leader, Adolf Hitler, under those conditions, we'll surrender. You know, it just wasn't going to happen. And it was the same attitude, I think, towards the Japanese at that time. You know, the Soviets, in just the two-week battle for the... Uh, the city of Berlin, they had 100,000 casualties just in that two-week battle. It just shows you how, how terrible this, this war had come to be. Well, and the other thing is, the Soviets, they weren't interested in negotiating a sur surrender. They were only days away from invading Japan and declaring war. So this was a surprise to the Japanese. They kept holding out you know, hopes that the Soviets would intervene somehow. But they were really weren't getting even the time of day when their ambassador Sato was in Moscow. I mean, they just weren't interested. So we know that this conjecture, you know, is just a futile effort on the part of the Japanese. You can just kind of cross it off the list. Okay, I call these conjectures because they're things that might have happened, but they didn't happen. Okay, So, well, you know, we could have just intensified the bombing and conventional bombing and blockaded and, and starved them, you know. That would have led to a Japanese surrender. Well, 
between March and July of 1945, we had already firebombed 60 Japanese cities, uh, approximately 300,000, and it's estimated as many as 500,000 Japanese civilians had already been killed. If we continued that bombing, there were 100, 100 more cities that were targeted, or like in the case of Tokyo, retargeted. So, you know, Hiroshima would have been firebombed. Nagasaki would have been firebombed. Maybe Kyoto, we don't know. Um, certainly Tokyo. Food supplies were running out because of the blockade. The average Japanese was living at a near a starvation uh, level of diet. Not the army. The army had s s warehoused about six months of food to cover them. And I'm sure the cabinet wasn't starving. I'm sure the emperor wasn't starving. But the average Japanese person was starving. And yet, as of August 1st, there was no indication of a change in the Japanese determination to fight to, you know, the final decisive battle. So, you know, it eventually probably would have happened. But at what cost? It would have been terrible cost to the Japanese. And by the way, during the first six months of 1945, there were more, each month, there were more than 100,000 Asian fatalities, or allies, at the hands of the Japanese. So there's the Chinese, East, East, uh, East Asia, Indonesia. On average, 100,000. So the longer the war was prolonged with continued bombing, it would have been a very ugly scene. And plus you wonder what they might have started doing with the uh, POWs. I think uh, Nancy may want to talk about that. So conjecture number three, well, you know, the Soviet invasion of Manchuria, that would have, that would have caused them to surrender. We, uh, Stalin had agreed at Yalta in February of 45 that within three months of the end of the European war, he would invade uh, Japan. He would declare war on Japan. So that, and he even promised at uh, Potsdam, he said, August 8th, <laughs> we'll be in the war on August 8th. But the idea wasn't, the agreement wasn't that the Soviets had come into the war and then we just sort of sit back and watch the show. Well, we, we were expected to execute Operation Downfall. The Soviets were going to tie up the 700,000 man Japanese Kwantung Kwantung Army in Manchuria so that they would not be available for the defense of the homeland. Uh, so uh, Stalin made it very clear. His expectation was Russia will share in the actual occupation of Japan, just like Germany, just like <laughs> Poland, only they didn't share in Poland. So, um, in my mind, that would, that would not have prevented an invasion and just would have complemented. Okay, why didn't we just do a demonstration, send them a warning, conduct a test out in some Pacific island somewhere? Well, that was seriously discussed at the highest levels of our government. You know, it really was considered as a possibility. Uh, Truman uh, established what's called a scientific advisory panel. Fermi, uh, Compton, I'm sorry. Truman established an interim committee. The committee established this scientific advisory panel to, to look at the issue, Fermi, Compton, Lawrence, and Oppenheimer. And they had acknowledged that, you know, quite a number of their fellow scientists, their colleagues, thought we should do a, uh, a demonstration. Of course, they had no 
access to any of the messaging and they really had no idea how how the Japanese military were so uh, <laughs> determined. But anyway, the scientific advisory panel said, we can see no, tep they concluded unanimously, we can see no technical demonstration likely to bring an end to the war. We see no acceptable alternative to direct military use. And then the interim committee made their report and they said, use the bombs against Japan at the earliest opportunity without warning against a dual, tar dual target. So conjecture number five, Japanese would have surrendered if we had just compromised regarding the emperor on the demand uh, for unconditional surrender. Now, in my mind, this is the one conjecture that has the most credibility. From everything I've read, if the Americans had made this offer, it would have been interpreted as a weakening of our resolve. You know, if we just hang in there a little further, they're already compromising, hang in there a little longer, and we'll get better terms. And besides, it would have been really unpopular in the United States if, if Truman had made that offer. 90% um, American people wanted Hirohito tried as a war criminal. 50% wanted him executed. However, if the Japanese had made the offer, let's say right after, right after Okinawa in June, if they had made the offer, I think there's a very good possibility that it would, it would have been accepted because Truman's top advisors, Stimson, Secretary of War, Gru, Acting Secretary of State, they were actively promoting the idea and Marshall and Leahy, Army and Navy, they were kind of receptive to the possibility, favorably inclined, because they knew that the influence of the emperor would be needed to get the compliance of this, there was five million man army out scattered around the Pacific, Japanese, and, and you know, 80 million Japanese civilians to get their compliance with the surrender, they knew the emperor's influence would be absolutely critical, and they were right. But the Japanese didn't make the offer. That's what's so sad about this. I think both sides were this close, but neither side wanted to blink, you know. Could have avoided the bombs, could have avoided Russia entry into the war, could have avoided the invasion but it didn't happen. So what did happen? August 6th, uh, dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. August 8th, one minute before midnight, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan, and one minute after midnight, they invaded Manchuria with like 1.2 million soldiers. And then on Three hours after midnight is when uh, the boxcar took off from Tinian with the uh, plutonium bomb and uh, Nagasaki was bombed. And six days later, Japan surrendered. To his credit, Emperor Hito, Hirohito, Broke, on, broke with tradition. Even after the two bombs and the Soviets had entered the war, the Supreme War Council was still split three to three as to whether to surrender or carry on to the fi final decisive battle. The, uh, the emperor knew that his country would be destroyed, his people would be destroyed. So he gave his famous speech, you know, the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. The enemy has developed a new and most cruel bomb. 
There, there was no mention of the Russian invasion in his speech, by the, by the way. But the Japanese people are now going to have to endure the unendurable and suffer the unsufferable. And he surrendered, and the Japanese did indeed comply. Now, full disclosure here, I have kind of a, like a personal <laughs> stake in this whole issue. My, my father was in the Navy and during World War II. He was over in North Africa and then over in Italy and into the Pacific. And his ship was in Tokyo Bay for the surrender. So he, he would have been part of the invasion force. There's no doubt about that. But even closer to me right now is my father-in-law, Kit's father, Dick Daly. Some of you know him. Well, he, he was a prisoner of war up here in northern Japan. And he, he survived the war. He, he was one of the Bataan. He survived the Battle of Bataan, was in prisoner of war camps in the Philippines, put on the hell ships, sent to Japan, and sent to a couple camps there in Japan. But he survived the war, came home, married his high school sweetheart, went to school on the GI Bill, raised a family of 10 kids, kids the oldest. And he's still alive and kicking down there in Santa Fe, his hometown, okay. 100 years old. Okay, so yeah. yeah. He's, he's a remarkable man in many ways. Of, of, the, of all the um, 1,800 New Mexico National Guard, there's only two left. Okay. He's, one, he's one of the two. Okay, well, thank you for listening to my perspectives on this issue about the decision to drop the bomb. I appreciate it. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. So, thank you. Thanks, John. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I hope it's hard to remember all those numbers, but the impression of what a Holocaust would have been if we had invaded. And I'd like to add a few things. Uh, one thing that gets me very, very upset is when we talk about how many people died in the Hiroshima bombing or the Nagasaki bombing. The number of military men that were killed through those bombings is never reported. In Hiroshima, 23,000 members of the Second Army were killed. 20,000 Korean conscripts were killed. That's 43. They're not included in the count. And I'd like to t explain to you why Hiroshima was considered a military target. I'm going to do some reading. I hope you will put up with me for reading. This is from a report from George Marquard, who was the pilot for Necessary Evil, which was the plane that accompanied Enola Gay and had observation equipment. And he says, uh, of the four cities that were set aside for the atomic bomb attack, Niigata was discarded because it was po poorly laid out. Nagasaki was the poorest of the laid, out, laid outs but it had a prisoner of war camp nearby. So it was made the third choice. The other two, Hiroshima and Kokora, were well laid out and relatively important. But Kokora had a prisoner of war camp, and Hiroshima had none to our knowledge. So it was, Hiroshima was a highly important as an industrial target. Prior to this attack, Hiroshima ranked as the largest city in the Japanese homeland, except for Kyoto, which had remained undamaged following a wave of B-29 incendiary strikes. Hiroshima was an army city, 
headquarters of the 5th Division, and a primary port of embarkation. In other words, for all the wars, when the Japanese left to go out and fight, they left from Hiroshima. There is a huge naval, naval complex right outside the city. Prominent in the north central part of the city are the Army Division headquarters marked by Hiroshima Castle. Numerous barracks, excuse me, administration buildings, and ordnance storehouses. In addition, there are the there are the following important military targets. Army Reception Center, Large Military Airport, Army Ordnance Depot, Army Food Depot, Large Port and Dock Area, Several Shipyards and Shipbuilding Companies, Japan Steel Company, Railroad Marshalling Yards, Numerous Aircraft Component Parts Factories. And then he talks about how it had been saved. Now, also, when I visited the Japanese museum in Hiroshima in 2001, on the, this is, I took pictures of their various posters. And it says, by the end of the war, most of Japan's major cities had been destroyed by the US air attacks. As John had said, over 60 cities had been destroyed. The reasons Hiroshima was chosen as the target or the A-bombing are assumed to be the following. This is the Japanese reasoning. The size and the shape of the city was suited to the destructive power of the A-bomb because it had not been bombed before. Ascertaining the effects of the A-bomb would be relatively easy. Hiroshima had a high concentration of troops, military facilities, and military factories that had not yet been subject to significant damage. And that's the Japanese telling the story. So that's part of what I want to say. Um, John, could you put Carlsbad up? Okay. These are the New Mexico National Guardsmen, 1,819, who were the best sharpshooters in the U.S. Army because they were federalized in January 1941. And they were sent over in August to defend the Philippines, um, the air base in the Philippines. The photographer of this picture uh, had two sons in this picture who did not make it back. It took me five years to get a copy of this picture, and it now is, resides with the Carlsbad National Park Service, if any of you are want a copy. So these gentlemen who defended us on, on the day of Pearl Harbor, Japan attacked many other countries at the same time. And in the Philippines, at Clark Base, they were waiting for the, uh, the uh, Japanese planes to come. They had sent 37 uh, airplanes up to look for them. And the planes didn't come, and they didn't come because there was bad weather in Formosa. So finally, they were running out of fuel. They came back and they landed. The pilots went in for lunch while the planes were being refueled and the Japanese Zeros and Mitsubishi came and they just strafed the planes and totally destroyed everything. It was in a row. So no longer the men had to defend an air, an air uh, base and so they went down south to defend the Philippines and then they went down south into what we call the Bataan Peninsula. And these men, uh, only, we only lost 20 of them in four months fighting with the Japanese. But then the Japanese brought in a quarter of a million troops and we, they were surrendered. So they were 
POWs uh, left in the Philippines and put in those hell ships. 11,000 of them were killed by our pilots bombing the ships that were not marked with the Red Cross cross. And so they thought our people, our guys thought that they were carrying uh, supplies, etc. That's another story. I give a whole lecture on it for an hour. But today I'm going to highlight the um, many of them died because of the maltreatment, lack of food. Uh, you heard about the Bataan Death March. Um, we lost thousand. We lost. We were two thousand out of twenty-five thousand American troops and fifty thousand Filipinos. There was no food to give them, but instead of letting Filipinos along the way uh, send them fruit or give them rice or let them have water, they killed anyone who stopped to get water or took food that they saw. Um, they would shoot them, and then they decided they were losing their ammunition, so they started cutting their heads off or cutting them or pushing them under a truck where they were flattened. So uh, that's that story. Um, show, show the um, number of POW camps. It's pretty hard to miss a POW camp when you destroy 60 cities. But there they were. In, in the summer of 44, the Japanese commanders sent out an all-kill uh, command to all the commanders of the camps. I'm looking for my title here. And, excuse me. Um, it was called Kill All Prisoners Order. And this was confirmed by one of the men, Tom Foy, that Professor Rogers and I interviewed from from Fort Baird, who was served, in, came back, and he served in the New Mexico legislature for 25 years. But the minute that our guys were to land on the beaches in Kyushu, these um, prisoners of war were to be exterminated. Whether they are destroyed individually or in groups, or however it is done with mass bombing, poisonous smoke, poisons, drowning, decapitations, or what? Dispose of them as the situation dictates. In any case, it is the aim not to allow the escape of a single one to annihilate them all and not to leave any traces. And one of the examples that we knew about was 145 men dug their own trenches and they were told to get into the trenches and they threw gasoline on them and they lit them on fire. And there were five men who escaped um, out of a, a, an area when the American POWs were digging the trenches five feet deep. Um, they had an escape and they felt, they slid down a cliff and the Japanese would try to kill any of them with machine guns, and those that got in the water were also shot. So five escaped, and the guerrillas saved them, and then another five were found. But then they finally made it back to MacArthur's headquarters, protected by the guerrillas, the Filipino guerrillas. Their story needs to be told and the massacre, and we knew about that. So when MacArthur's troops were coming, you know, I shall return. This is a wonderful, wonderful book, Ghost Soldiers by Hampton Sides. It tells about the rescue of 515, 16, 
of POWs who had been left in the Philippines in Cambana, Tawan, and um, they're barely alive. They were d dying daily. Uh, but this is a wonderful book, and the Sixth Army rescued them. MacArthur stopped the troops for a day. Um, I, there's one of the fellows that worked at the lab who was in MacArthur's group that told about having nothing to do for a day, but they were stopped because, uh, and, and their rescue is, is another story to be told, a film to be made. And those men would not have come home. He wasn't a married kid. <laughs> Um, and that's pretty much what I want to say, except that in September, I've been invited to give a talk uh, at the Los Alamos Historical Society fall series, lecture series. And I plan to talk about Japan's longest day. John has talked some about the decision, unanimous decision that had to be made. And, and how it was finally agreed to. But he hasn't told you about the army uh, having a coup and almost stopping the emperor's message from being broadcast. And in fact, the, um, the commander, Matt Mori, who was um, in charge of, of the area where the emperor was kept during the war, was murdered, and they took his honko, you know, the stamp, and they had another message to send out to the troops all around Asia, which was continue your fighting. Anyway, it's another wonderful story, and I'd like to share it with you all, because I want Los Alamos to get into the skin of the Japanese thinking and why the bombs were necessary to end the war. Um, a number of them have people who said or quoted ministers who were part of the decision that the bombs allowed the leaders to tell the populace that we, had, we were superior in science, but the Japanese military were not defeated by the Americans. They could still keep the belief that they had never lost a war because of their milita military prowess. And so um, some of them said it was, it was a miracle that helped the, those on the, the three people who were trying out of that uh, six body, six person body, to um, try to stop the war, find a way to stop the war. And the bombs we're it. So I will stop there, and we will entertain any discussion, sharing ideas, um, asking questions, whatever. Thank you very much for being here. John, I'm going to get a drink. Excellent talk by both of you. Um, Question for either one of you. Out of the 1,800 New Mexican uh, National Guardsmen, how many came home? Oh, okay. About half. Right. Uh, it, I've seen uh, 500, 900. That's what I had in my book from 2004. But I've seen a more recent number that it was more in uh, around 600 some. But I've also seen, and we lost about a third in the first year or two because of their, the treatment that, that their bodies had gotten. Um, but we just lost, recently we lost the governor of Taos and he was over 100. A number of men have lived to be 100. The one other one that I'm aware of that lives in Almogordo now, his name is De Herrera, he's 103. <laughs> Tough. Those guys were tough, you know, really. I mean, they had every disease you can imagine, you know, tropical disease, and they survived and 
got on with their lives. I'm, I'm curious about when the um, kill order was given, how many Allied prisoners were there in Japan at the time, and how many of them actually were killed? Diane, I did not, I did not plant this question, but I have a sheet. <laughs> um, this comes from Richard Frank's uh, book, in um, January of 1944, there were 12,700 U.S. POWs, they think. May 15, 1945, 22,000 U.S. Uh, uh, prisoners, 1,000, uh, no, excuse me, 126,000 British, of which 67,000 were Indians. So that's like 150,000. We're talking about um, lives uh, who were rescued by are uh, not um, um, invading. And also Tom Foy, Tom Foy um, was on Camp Omuta in Nagasaki at the time Hiroshima was bombed. And uh, he had gone to the latrine around 8 o'clock, and uh, when he saw the fire, etc., cetera, um, he thought he was, that was his last day because the men in the camp had uh, machine guns pointed at them all the time, and he was told, he and others were told by the guards that the Japanese had put oil in pipes and put them all around the beaches that they would have to land in because of the geographic features. And then when our guys got on the beach, they would set the oil on fire and let it go, just like the Greeks. And um, so that's the answer now. Um, there were, in Hiroshima, there were um, there was a crew that got uh, downed and um, some of the men were killed uh, killed by the populace and uh, some were radiated by the, radi by the bomb and died a little bit later. And one of them, I think the league commander had gone to another city uh, to be interred and uh, he, he, he could tell the story. Does that answer? That gives you an idea of the comparison of the, our, guy, our guys or their guys. Uh, thank you both. I would have two questions, if I may. The first one, if you see a difference between civilian and military targets, and to what degree you can differentiate in the case of, of the two cities. And the second one would be, you, you've given um, quite emotional talk, I would say. Um, and based on that, it evoked a bit the feeling in me of this is also a bit of a retaliation story. So how much is this thought of retaliation reason, maybe, that there never has been a, an apology for both these bombings? Do you think there is an apology that should be given or not? No, I do not think there should be an apology. When I was teaching there 13 years after the war was over, was discussing it with my students, and they said, we started the war, you ended it. That was it. Um, I, I don't see a difference between the military and the civilian in terms of our drop, dropping bombs, because as he described, the, um, there wasn't much of a difference. The, the people who were in their homes were mar making different products that were being used by the military. And also, we, he talked about the training of the, of the civilians to defeat, to kill 10 Americans uh, with your, with your um, what is that? Uh, yeah, when you blow, throw, I'm doing a senior moment. Um, 
Well, you blow people up. Hand grenade, thank you. Take your hand grenade and take 10 Americans with you when you go. So I taught in Japan. I love the Japanese. I've been back five times, so I'm going to go back again. Um, but OK. My husband would have been angry with me if I had not talked about uh, my letter from one of my students. Oh, gosh, I hope I can find it here. Um, his name is Onizuka. He, um, he thanks America for rescuing him from the military. He was born the same year I was. He took my family around um, Japan. Uh, he, he came to America. He was in charge of 100 engineers in Atlanta. Um, and he investigated the facts in my book. Um, and he agreed with them. His family, when his town was, when we dropped napalm on his town, his family ran into the forest. And those that went into the bombs, bombing uh, um, place to protect yourself were incinerated or um, smoke damage. They died of smoke damage. Uh, Chitaka-san says, One of my high school teachers who taught English at Itsunomiya High School, that's where he went, told us statistic atrocities were prosecuted even on Japanese troops in Burma Adelines in the jungle. And a huge number of Japanese soldiers died there under very bad circumstances of high temperature, high humidity, tropical diseases, little food, and few weapons. He used to work for Japanese Army as a military dependent interpreter. I was told also that bonsai charges were many times implemented by Japanese snipers, aiming at French soldiers behind from their back and only to go forward. Uh, he knew about the Japanese relocation internment camps from friends. Um, he said he wished that Japan had paid reparations to people other than um, uh, non-military as well as military. If we had, if we had, if so, we would not. We won't see anti-Japanese rally in China now. This was uh, around 2016. I take very much interest in the story of how chain reaction that is. The important fundamental breakthrough was invented by Leo Szilard when he was waiting for the traffic signal described on my page 197. It teaches us in invention or breakthrough will be made by individual and not by majority. The genius scientists listed up in your book are all well known worldwide in the textbooks used in technical schools. I knew these names in the textbook used at the Tokyo University in Sendai. When the atomic bomb was dropped at Hiroshima, people told an unusual and mysterious bomb blasted and wondered what it was. Dr. Hantaro Nagaoka, who was the top scientist in Japan at that time, said, it may be an atomic bomb, but if it is true, the advent of it was too early and unbelievable. And he says again, he also says, I really feel some invisible power that may be called God did not stand at atrocious and fanatic dictators like Hitler in Germany or Tojo and his fanatic militants in Japan. Germany was once in the position most closely to reach atomic bomb, but in vain. I am happy we were liberated from these brutal dictators by allied forces, mainly consisting of the US and Britain. And then there are a few other things. 
from, from everything I've read, Truman's intention was to end the war as quickly as possible with as few casualties to, 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 to Americans. But they felt it would take a shock effect, you know, because, again, they knew how recalcitrant the Japanese military were in particular and how they were looking forward to this final battle. So um, to drop the bombs, one after the other, two of them, uh, was to create this shock effect in the hopes that it would have the effect that it did. And in fact, it, 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 that was what caused the emperor to declare it was his divine will that the Japanese surrender and accept the Potsdam Declaration. Without that divine will, the, material, the, the military would not have surrendered at that time. Sorry, I have, I have the mic. Sorry, where, where is it? Okay. And then I will pass it on to you. Um, Nancy, I was just wondering whether you could, you spent a lot of time in Japan also teaching there, um, whether you could maybe share some stories of, you already have with the letter, but um, kind of how you, as an American, investigating and talking to people about what happened, um, how that was received, and also um, whether maybe there was also some hostility from you asking these questions or wanting to find out more about these things. Okay. Oh, golly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all kinds of things run through my head. Um, I was well received. I was a teacher. In Japan, a teacher is higher than anybody else. Or someone who goes to your college, your alumni. Um, and so I, um, in the Monday night, I, I would be taken to the Institute, Scientific Institute. The, they would send a car. And I filled in for a, a, a British gal who had left, and she had a class of, I, I want to say 60, but I think it was more like 40 men who's wit. And the oldest student was 60 years old. And um, when we were leaving class, I would let him go first because he was my elder. No, I'm his sensei, so I'm supposed to go first. And so back and we went back and forth. And finally, I went first. Um, we were, Americans were received very well. My, and UNESCO, I taught at UNESCO. And these were young men who were engineers who were going to be sent abroad. And they needed to be able to write um, scientific reports in good English. And so we were doing English conversation. They were, they were tall. <laughs> they were, had beautiful teeth. I could have fallen in love with them, except my sweetheart was back in America, and I'm pining away for him and writing to him every day. But if I hadn't had John on my mind, the other John, the other John, the other John. <laughs> um, I would have. I could have fallen in love with him, with one of them, um, but I swore I would not want to cook fish and rice for breakfast for the rest of my life. And so, but the fact that America sent wheat and milk, and those men, didn't, those young boys, didn't uh, grow up with their knees bent. Japan changed the way you would sit to eat, whatever. Uh, they they grew up strong and handsome. Um, let's see. Okay, another. So um, when when uh, up and uh, no, um, Eisenhower was our president, and the Prime Minister Kishi was running for office again. And Kishi had been a war criminal that was never, I don't think he was ever tried. But <clears throat> America used leaders, even though they had some problems 
with what they did during the war, but they, he was prime minister. And uh, Eisenhower um, chose not to come. He, brought, he changed his um, plans to come because it were, was the visit to uh, and continue the treaty between the two countries would be perceived as Eisenhower supporting Kishi being reelected. And the socialist, the socialist labor people uh, um, paraded. And in Tokyo, it was written up in Time Magazine, et cetera. So um, my students, the young girls, came to take me shopping or something. And I said, do you think I'm safe going past the parade of socialists? And, uh, and socialists is what they were named. They weren't aggressive uh, activists. And so they said, no, you'll be fine. You'll be with us. No problem. And so we walked opposite the way they were going. And the guys would wave to me and say, hello, hello, and use their English. You know, it was they were being paid a, a day off to parade. It wasn't uh, so. I thought it's a long answer of some of the examples. But um, I, I taught in a school that was a mission school that had been started years before the war. And then the Japanese uh, switched the teachers. If you were from one Protestant uh, a church, you would be sent to a school of a different Protestant church so to reduce the impact on the power that the non-Japanese had. Yes. Denny had his hand up, too. OK, go ahead. Hi. Um, I don't think any of us would argue that the war needed to end. And I think what I'm having a very hard time with in this conversation is that what has not been explicitly acknowledged is that we are talking about a nuclear bomb. We are talking about atomic energy. We are talking about a level of impact and a new player on a planetary level that had ever been introduced before. And that the angle that is being taken on this is how torturous and inhumane the Japanese were to the Americans. Almost as if there is some logic that they deserved it because they were gasoline lighting troops in trenches and there is no acknowledgement that we are at Los Alamos lab, a, a, a laboratory dedicated to the creation of nuclear energy, that we are in New Mexico, that the creation of this bomb had an impact, that the atrocities and the inhumane path that led to the creation of this bomb, if we want to talk about inhumane atrocities and the way that that bomb and the uranium was experimented on the Navajo people of this land, on people that are still dying and being affected by the creation of that bomb, let alone the dropping of that bomb in Japan, that it is ex it feels extremely myopic to be given a sort of patriotic retaliation story of how cruel and inhumane the Japanese were because of their tactics without any acknowledgement of what what we actually did what that bomb actually was and as if our american military right now isn't doing that level of inhumane atrocities all over this planet and that they weren't doing it in that war. <clears throat> I'm an engineer. I spent most of my career working at the lab on the weapons program. So I don't know anybody that I worked with or in this town that would not like to see a future with no nuclear weapons in the world. However, if 
if there's going to be disarmament, you know, it, it, it has to be universal and it has to be verifiable. It cannot be unilateral. It just, that doesn't make sense. So the laboratory's mission and responsibility is to keep the nuclear stockpile safe, secure, and reliable. You know, and, and, and so that's what we, uh, that's why we uh, have weapons that can maybe be deteriorating over decades of time. They are no longer perhaps reliable. So that's why the mission of the laboratory is what it is. But I'm not, I'm not actually asking for a defense of the mission of the laboratory. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about this particular talk right now. Okay. And that it has been literally stated that there is no apology necessary. Absolutely. That there is no, that there is no acknowledgement that we created and detonated two bombs on this planet that have changed the face of the possibility of life on this planet and the armament that is now global and the, and the nuclear poisoning, the uranium that is all radiating and affecting so many lives of the Navajo people, of the Japanese people. If the bombs had not been dropped on Japan, the technology was there. Is there any reason to believe that the world, since they were not willing to come to an agreement of universal control of nuclear weapons, you know, the Cold War, I mean, the two sides just the, we were not willing to make that uh, move. So the nuclear weapons are there. They would have continued to be there. Uh, here's a war, again, I, I try to think, a war of 60 million fatalities, you know? And we have a chance to bring it to an end quickly. That was the perspective that the president was taking. So you say, well, it's a whole nother step, you know, in technology or whatnot. The technology was there, you know? But, the, but Truman used those bombs to bring the war to an end. I think he did save millions of lives. Because if we'd had an invasion, that's the kind of loss that I, th that I would think. So I don't know how you compare one life to another. Is a Chinese life worth less, worth less than a Japanese life? They were dying by the hundreds of thousands every month in China. Okay, so to me, it just made sense to bring the war to an end, which it did. In the movie, it brings up that they dropped leaflets ahead of time to warn the civilians, and I had been aware of that before, that that was done. Is there any evidence, how many people, were there any that heeded it, that were able to get out of the cities, or what, what do we know about that? There was no leaflet dropped on Hiroshima. Oh. The whole idea was, as Grove expressed, was to surprise the Japanese, but there were thousands of leaflets dropped on Nagasaki and around. And the Hume Museum used to have, I don't know whether it still does, the Los Alamos History Museum, had copies of those leaflets and translations of those telling the people. I think if people were not supposed to pick them up, they were dropped, but they weren't picked up. They were. Japanese Americans who were in the MIS helped to translate and to give those messages. And so that's when you hear about the leaflets dropped. They were dropped for after Hiroshima. Okay. And it was to be, that's also an argument to not do a